Okay, so here we are. It's March 10th of 2023. Um, thank you all for inviting me. Um, my name is Herb Walker, for those of you that haven't met me yet. I run a ministry called South Beach Gospel Ministries. We've been based on Ocean Drive on South Beach here in Miami Beach for the past 20 years. We've been doing evangelism, and for the last few years, we've been putting it on YouTube. So if anybody hasn't yet, like and subscribe on YouTube, South Beach Gospel Ministries. And if you make a comment on the videos, it always helps the algorithm and it pushes it out. So tonight, we've got a very strange topic that we're going to be discussing. And the topic is going to be, as I've laid out in my notes there, UFOs and the Bible. Now, why are we meeting on a Friday night to discuss UFOs at a Bible study? That seems like a non-traditional topic, and it's a topic that you don't generally find being discussed in the pulpits and churches throughout the land, or your TV evangelists who are usually asking you to send in some money, and he's going to send you some prosperity. But what we're doing is looking at the Bible and what the Bible says about the last days in time. Bible prophecy is one third of the Bible, you know, every, one out of every three verses in the Bible relates to some prophetic passage. And so the reason why I thought that UFOs would be timely was because in the last, you know, month or so, we've been inundated in mainstream media with references and comments about UFOs. Why? Because of these strange balloons. Remember there was a balloon that went across the entire United States of America, went across Canada, came out of Alaska, and was eventually shot down over the Atlantic Ocean. And then, a week or so later, an octagonal-shaped object was shot down over Lake Huron in Michigan, where I grew up. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Ann Arbor, Michigan was the subject of one of the most controversial UFO sightings in the history of the world that led to a congressional investigation and Project Blue Book and all of that. And when I started seeing increased reports on UFOs, and I heard somebody from the Pentagon say that, you know, it's, you know UFOs are real. We can't confirm or deny whether they're piloted by extraterrestrials or not. And then I saw in a White House press briefing, uh, you know, two or three weeks ago, another reference to UFOs and them being real objects. And then we remember about two years ago, the Air Force actually released footage of actual UFOs. Now, why is that tangential? Why is that important for a Bible study? I think it's important to point out that up until about 24 months ago, about two years ago, the government of the United States of America has steadfastly denied the existence of UFOs since this incredible supposed crash landing of the UFO in Roswell, New Mexico, and supposedly alien bodies were recovered. And that occurred in the summer of 1947. Since that time, the government has officially denied the existence of UFOs for decades without fail, up until about 24 months ago. Why is that important? It's important because the existence of UFOs has been used by enemies of the Bible, and here we are, we're all born again believers. Enemies of the Bible have suggested without fail that if UFOs exist, then they must be piloted by extraterrestrials. And the extraterrestrials would have to be so much more advanced than regular human beings that they must have been around for millions and millions of years. If that's true, if UFOs do exist and they're piloted by extraterrestrials who are millions of years more advanced, then that would prove dispositively the Darwinian theory of evolution that was popularized in the late 1800s in England, right? Because UFO aliens would be carbon-based life forms just like us, except they've been around for millions of years. The Bible teaches that about 6,000 years ago, there was something called special creation, meaning that God created the original universe and placed the man that he created out of dirt that he had just created and placed him in the garden and he gave him a wife and told him to get married and have kids. And that's where life comes from in the universe. Special creation in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, which, you know, depending on who you talk to theologian-wise, about 6,000 years ago, supposedly that stuff happened. Now, and we have right here, I got my little chart there. We've got our 6,000 year timeline chart, which I'll let you, know, let you guys take a look at. And basically, this gives us that timeline that we discussed that the creation of the world occurred about 6,000 years ago, right here in the Garden of Eden. And that we're right here at the end of that 6,000 year period. If UFOs are real, 
and they are in fact piloted by extraterrestrials, then they would have to themselves be highly evolved creatures who once upon a time were primitive like us, but over the course of millions of years evolved into these super smart people that can build these spaceships that can fly across vast distances of space. The reason why that's important for us is it disproves the reality of the Bible. So what we're going to talk about tonight is what are UFOs? Are they real? Well, the government has told us after decades of denying it, they are real. And they've shown us footage, right. and we're going to look at some footage of, of these UFOs that the Air Force actually has released uh, footage similar to this and said, yes, these are UFOs. And what I suspect, what I predict coming down the road is that soon there will be a disclosure, disclosure. that they in fact are piloted by extraterrestrials who are highly evolved beings from other parts of the universe. And that, my friends, would disprove the Bible. <clears throat> what that's going to do is destroy the faith of many people who are new Christians, and it's going to destroy the possibility of you evangelizing to people that aren't saved yet and get them to believe the Bible. So we need to know what is it that people are seeing in these lights in the skies. Right. Are they actually extraterrestrials from another planet, from another universe, from another galaxy, and we're going to talk about why we believe that UFOs do in fact exist, but they're not piloted by little green men from <laughs> Venus or Mars or from the next galaxy over, and we're going to show some, you know, in, in the video we're going to look at, we're going to see why from, from an astronomical standpoint that it would be impossible for a carbon-based life form to fly from one part of our universe to another part of our universe in a spaceship. And therefore, we can be confident that even though the government has admitted the UFOs are real and that probably very soon they'll admit that they're piloted by extraterrestrials, we can still have confidence in the Bible. But we need to have an explanation for who and what these objects known as UFOs are. So what I'd like to do right now they're is... Used, they're going to be used as a tool to... To destroy the faith, destroy right? The faith again. And More so the topic, the UFOs in the Bible, and the subtitle of tonight's message is The Coming Great Deception. And I would suggest to you that both Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, and Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, both warned of a last day's coming deception that would be so great that it would destroy the faith of people. And I would suggest to you guys that we have a topic and we have an event in the Bible called the pre-tribulation rapture. The rapture is an event in the Bible that we're going to probably talk about in, in, in the future. Tonight we won't have time to talk about everything. We're going to hit upon the UFOs. Maybe next week, but Lord willing, if the rapture doesn't happen first, we'll talk about uh, you know a topic called... I call the return of the Nephilim. We're going to talk about oh, the Nephilim. Good. Goodness forbid. These two topics are tied to UFOs and the Nephilim yeah. that are referred to in the Bible. It gives us an explanation for what these strange events are that have been gaining, you know, uh, you know, common parlance in mainstream media and the government and the yeah. White House. And so it ties in. It is, it is my proposition. We'll talk about this when we get to the end of our talk that the pre-tribulation rapture is an event that the Bible says true born-again believers in Jesus Christ will be snatched up from the face of the planet Earth and taken to the Father's house in heaven where we will be with the Lord Jesus for seven years while on the face of the planet Earth, the 70th week of Daniel or this tribulation period will occur. And I brought a chart here that kind of helps describe that. Mm -hmm. So... Is it possible that Satan, who has read the Bible and knows it better than most believers, knows of this event called the rapture, where at the end of the church era, which Jesus and Paul said in the last days, just before the church era is over, and it's gone on for 2,000 years now, he said, deception is going to come. Jesus said, many are going to come in my name and deceive many. Uh, Paul said that the Antichrist will come yeah. after the rapture, and he's going to deceive the world with what? Signs and lying wonders. Are UFOs and aliens tied in to this great deception that Paul refers to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as the lie? What is the the lie that scripture is talking about? I would submit to you that it's very likely that it has something to do with UFOs, and it would be the only way 
that Satan could disclaim or explain away the pre-tribulation rapture. And again, if the pre-tribulation rapture is the disappearance of every born-again believer from the face of the earth, you got about 8 billion people on the planet Earth now, so that if, even if one out of every 10 persons is a born-again believer, you still have, that's an enormous amount of people. You, you're talking about the disappearance of up to, you know, between 500 million and a billion people disappearing instantaneously from all over the world. If that occurred, the people left behind are going to say, wait a minute, I remember that guy from South Beach Gospel Ministry. He was always down on Ocean Drive preaching about this event called, the, what was it called? The Rapture. When Jesus will come and take his people, the Bible must be true. We've been left behind. They're going to run to the first you know, church they can find and pray and receive Jesus as their Savior, right? Because they're going to know, oh my gosh, right. the only way a billion people disappear, right. different races, ethnic groups, countries, all over the world at exactly the same moment in time, without a trace, they're going to turn to Jesus unless there's an explanation given for them. And right. I submit to you the only possible explanation that Satan could come forward with to explain away this most spectacular event in the history of the human race, the rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ in heaven, would be the extraterrestrial UFO hypothesis. And we've been prepared for that for the last 50 years oh. with movies coming out of Hollywood, right? Yeah. You know, Star Trek, you could beam me up, Scotty, and they used a transporter, and they would beam people up, and they would disappear, and they'd get you transported up to the spaceship. So, it has been suggested by a number of conservative Bible scholars, Chuck Missler, Dave Hunt, who we'll hear from tonight, and many others, that UFOs could be part and parcel of that great lie that Satan will have to use to explain away the rapture lest people turn to Christ en masse after the rapture of the church. If UFOs are part of that, actually, that would be the only thing that could explain away the disappearance so, of people, so right? Satan is using the UFOs? Yeah. Absolutely. That is going to be our contention, and we're going to support it, that Satan will use UFOs as an explanation as to what happened. Because he, yeah. Satan knows the Bible better than most Christians. Yeah. And he knows Bible prophecy is coming. And he knows that the very first prophecy in the Bible actually predicts that a virgin-born God-man will go to war with the seed of the serpent, which means a biogenetic offspring of Satan. Satan wow. will have an entity in human flesh that will go to war with Jesus Christ. Wow. And that will occur at the Battle of Armageddon. He knows his time is drawing short, so he knows, oh, wait a minute, Armageddon is coming, but seven years before that, the rapture of the church has to occur. Right. I better get an explanation so prepared. The rapture of the church is when, when these billion people are, are going to... Yeah. yeah every, what's going to happen? If you can just okay, so there? so now and we have some new believers here, so what we're, we're, we're looking at right here, let's take a look here. I'm a new believer, too. So, Baby believer. so come on up here, if you could, and be my Vanna White for me, and hold on to my... Sure. Michelle is, is, has been so great. Michelle is, is she, by the way, she's one of the finest, you know, uh, producers of cat breeds in the world. She was in my Sunday school class years ago, and she's gone up to be a great, incredible businesswoman. I'm so proud of her. So anyway, here's our um, 70 weeks of Daniel timeline proxy chart. Basically, we see that. There was a period of time predicted that Jesus would come to be crucified. That was part of Daniel chapter 9. We'll be talking about that on South Beach tomorrow. Um, and I'll put that on YouTube for you guys to take a look at. But after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there's this parenthetical gap between the first 69 weeks of the years and the final 70th week of the years where the seven-year tribulation period will occur. Antichrist will come, sit on the throne in the temple and declare himself to be God. It's a seven year period of time that'll be preceded by the departure of the church to heaven. That's an event that is commonly referred to as the rapture. And it's spoken about in John chapter 14, verses one, two, and three, where Jesus says, I'm going away to my father's house to prepare a place for you, but don't be sad because when it's done, I'm gonna come back and get you to receive you, to take you where I am so that where I am, you can be also. Paul writes about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, an event where in a flash and a twinkle of an eye, we will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's different from the second coming. So this rapture event will occur at the end of the church age and will allow the Antichrist to come out and rule for the final seven years of human history before the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back to fulfill Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the, the, the conflict with the Antichrist. Jesus Christ versus the Antichrist but that has to be preceded by a seven year period of time when Satan's going to rule on throne. And, okay, so we'll take a look using this chart and here we're going to talk about the same thing. So here we have the human history, 6,000 years. Jesus is crucified here. Here's the fall in the garden. Jesus goes up into heaven after the resurrection, and there's this 2,000-year period of time known as the church era. When it comes to a close, which it will, through the rapture, then there will be this final seven-year period of time when the Antichrist will be allowed to rule on earth which will end when Jesus comes back at the second coming. And so, with that, that's our description of the rapture. And so that event is something that is so catastrophic that during that seven-year period of time, there are going to be people left behind on the earth, right. and they're going to want to know what happened. What happened to right. the people? Right. If they come to the conclusion that the rapture happened to the people, and they went home to be with Jesus, they're going to come to Christ, because right. they're going to know, oh my gosh, those preachers and teachers about the Bible and the they Bible, were right. They, they were right all those years. I thought but, they were being so the be the chosen people. Well, the well, when you say chosen people, there are a couple of different chosen people in the Bible. Israel's chosen, and the church is chosen. The church will be gone. Israel, for the most part, will be left behind because they haven't come to Christ. But during this last seven year, Jesus is going to use. These prophets, 144,000 Jewish prophets, are going to be primarily focused on evangelizing Israel. And so the Bible says all Israel will be saved. God's going to supernaturally protect them during this last seven-year period of time. But Gentiles that are left behind, there's no special guarantee. And the Bible says that God himself will give a strong delusion to those Gentile people left behind who have rejected the gospel. Why? So they could... You know, be damned for having rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ when they had an opportunity to uh, to accept it. And that's part of the lie. God himself is going to give Satan power to deceive the people with this great lie yeah. that nobody really, like, what is this lie that's talked about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2? I think we have the answer to it. And so we're going to look at our video. Um, really interesting. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be, uh, we're going to take a look at that. And are, are we around those seven years now? I would, su I would submit to you that where we're at right now is at the very, very end of the church era, which means that that final seven years will begin to run when? It'll begin to run when the rapture occurs and after the rapture occurs. The young Pennsylvania father, Stephen Pulaski. The rapture itself will occur when... Um, when Jesus snatches out the church, the Bible says in, in uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verses 24 through 26 that after the rapture, there's going to be the seven-year period of time Antichrist will come to the fore. And so uh, it will be a, a tree that's going to be confirmed shortly after the rapture that will, will start a seven-year period of time. So pretty much right after the rapture, you can... You, you'll know that it'll, Satan it'll, will know yeah, that years. there's going to be seven years left. And so he's going to begin his propaganda campaign to explain away what happened to these people because it's going to be on the news. It's going to be, you know, it'll be the biggest event that ever happened in the history of the world. And the only thing that could counteract mm -hmm. that incredible moment when Jesus comes for his church and takes out 800 a million people or a billion people off the face of the planet Earth, I think we'll have to tie into UFOs and extraterrestrials and their disappearance. So let's take a look and see what this video, we're going to see some interesting footage here, and let's listen. There's several clips we're going to look at, and then we'll talk after we're finished with it. So yeah, so I, I I think this is this really 
if we get this understood, we're ahead of the curve because yeah. we're already seeing Hollywood doing the, the extraterrestrial movies that they've been doing for the last 50 years. And now we see the government, after having denied UFOs for 50 years, all of a sudden in the last 24 months, UFOs are real. And maybe they were run by extraterrestrials. A thousand years ago, men believed that the Earth was flat. 500 years ago, men believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. And the sun, moon, and stars all circled the Earth. 200 years ago, men believed that it was impossible for stones to fall from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. Meteorites, they argued, were merely stones on Earth that had been struck by lightning. 100 years ago, men so believed see, that science is advancing and our belief Bishop system said that are changing. was reserved for the angels. His two sons, Wilbur and Orville, later proved their father wrong. Fifty years ago, Sir Harold Spencer Jones, the director of the Greenwich Observatory, predicted that man would never set foot on the surface of the moon. See, and it says in Daniel chapter 12 that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. So we're going to be able to advance scientifically ago, and knowledge. Stories about UFOs circling the globe and landing on this planet were considered hoaxes or hallucinations. Yet more than 15 million witnesses, equipment, photographs, movies, videos, physical records, and scientific data have proved, again, that man can be wrong. And we're actually looking at UFO Most people today footage, footage. There's, there's no question, the question that they're real. The question is, they are what are they? Most right. science fiction right. films and books. This is, of course, a relatively recent conception. It has been stimulated, perhaps, by our expanding knowledge of outer space. But strange sights appeared in the skies long before spaceflight or manned flight of any kind was possible. And in each century, these visions took on identities that tell much about the worldview of those who saw them. Alexander the Great and his army, for instance, were harassed by a pair of flying objects in 329 BC. Wow. Most of the soldiers fled the sea. But Centuries some of the before Jesus. And stood their wow. ground and tried to hit the disc with their arrows and with stones from their slings. <coughs> in 1492, just four hours before discovering land, Christopher Columbus so saw a bright glowing object come out of the sky, flow into the water and traveled slowly through the water very close to the ship that he was on. Engraved onto a French token minted in the 1860s is a disc-shaped flying object Look at this. that experts say it's made like a flying saucer there, huh? a daytime UFO. 3,000 year old coin. The great the British astronomer Edmund Hallett, <laughs> a comic <laughs> fan, also saw a series of unexplained aerial objects in March of 1760. That's the guy that One they named Halley's Comet after. More than two hours. Scientists have seen these things. They've and been the around for a while. The could read a printed text by what is it that we're looking at? There were sightings in 1897 of a lighter than airship that had propellers, porthole windows, and brilliant searchlights, which it directed at the ground. In 1917, what may have been the largest crowd ever to witness a UFO occurred in Fatima, Portugal. We all know that the Captain Charles and people watched in amazement wow. as a huge silver disc began spinning like a windmill and dancing about in the sky. Wow. After so Captain Church says, oh, that was, you know, uh, Mother Mary, the Virgin Mary appeared in, you know, Fatima. Wow. And that's where you had the miracle of Fatima. Okay. So you have these supernatural appearances that are being tied together with UFOs. And right. because we've learned from the first clip here that we looked at, Alexander the Great went to war against a UFO in the sky centuries, right. you know, before Jesus before was on the earth. We find, that, you know, that uh, Napoleon went to war with UFOs. What were they? They didn't know it. They didn't have science fiction movies back then. Right. They didn't have the government either confirming or denying the existence of UFOs. So we know that these items, these shining lights in the sky have been around since before the time of Jesus. So again, our question is, what is it that we're looking at? So I'm going to jump you guys ahead and we're going to take a look real quick, if we could, at our next clip. And then we're going to tie it all together and you guys are going to be
you know, way ahead of the curve in terms of knowing the truth. The and you're going to be able to use that into the to sky. help other people uh, understand what the truth is. seemed to hover for a matter of maybe one or two seconds. And then it uh, was out of the sight within two or three seconds. Uh, we looking at actual UFO footage similar to what the government released uh, within the last 24 months or so. Look at the spotlight and pointing in the direction of that the UFO. And it was reacting to it audibly on occasion. And uh, it did make a movement towards the light. Is we turn the light off, then it would return to its original position and remain stationary again. But That's it was the UFO. To the light. Yep. All right, oh, wow. It would be at yep. least 150 feet. Sometimes they look like ships. Sometimes they look like stars so that move here. around. Just like a light on. It's very shiny under, under the See, a the similar or saucer shape like is the most common the of the shapes. Sometimes it's a light, other times it's, it looks like a mechanical vehicle. I feeling on my hair on the arms and uh, my head. I thought it was doomsday. He would stand in the doorway screaming at me to get up and try to get out of here as soon as he did. And now look out there and it was pitch black. It looks like book. She did it right now. He's got a hold of me and he's shaking me and screaming at me. Is that a real video? I mean, he just that's a real video so now that really one i can't i can't confirm which that one is that's crazy but that's a real video yeah that's what it's that that you know that these these are from more than 20 years ago so you're hearing the testimony people interacted with entities that apparently came from out of some green the second time I felt like death was at hand. I think this was it. And as soon as it touched down, it didn't hold it and just spit it out. So the question is, who is lighting those? That's the question that we're going to be looking at tonight, and we're going to answer it by the time we get to the end of our study. Who or what, what and whom are these entities that come from our few ships? Very typical, large heads, small bodies. Classic UFO, extraterrestrial alien type. Martian. Martian. They are, according to very large eyes. So this is what people actually saw. Yeah, so you're hearing live testimony. So this clearly isn't something just, just coming out of Hollywood. These are people just from everyday life saying, this is what I saw and this is what they look like. Who are these guys? Are these highly evolved entities from, you know, another galaxy? We're going to find out that that would be impossible. Million people have reported seeing UFOs, of which over 2,000 were encounters with landed UFOs and their occupants. UFOs have been fired upon by jet fighters and anti-aircraft missiles, but with no effect. They give off powerful electromagnetic charges often causing the breakdown of engines and electrical circuitry. They evoke strange and fearful reactions in animals and frequently cause profound psychological disturbances in humans. I don't know. I think they're used. They have the ability to materialize. Herbal as if know, <laughs> But more often, vanish. That, that, that's, in the midst now, of the a mechanical craft can't disappear, disappear, right? Observe unbelievable. Things are science, but it's yeah, several thousand miles per hour. Now, what these, these things are doing is miles per hour. Yeah. It can be no longer any doubt. If an airplane moving at 16,000 miles an hour made a right angle turn like that, it would turn your body into liquid. You would be liquefied because of G forces. Right. And they would come from at least two million light years. Now, here's the truth that traveling at light speed. 186,000 miles per second. It would take two million years to get there. But suppose the UFOs come from some distant star in our own galaxy. If these space visitors were to travel one million miles a day, it would take 70,000 years to reach the Earth from the nearest star, Alice oh, wow. and Truth. The nearest star. 75,000 years. Other stars are thousands further out in space. Conservative estimates indicate that it's a this. carrying 10 people and traveling five light years to and from a nearby star system 
at 70% of the speed of light would consume 500,000 times the amount of energy used in the United States in one year. 500,000 But times. there are other complications of space travel. There's another reason why they can't space be is not a vacuum, entities cosmic gas flying across, across space. Cosmos. Nobel Prize winner Professor Edward Purcell of Harvard points out that a space vehicle traveling at the speed of light would collide with this space material in the form of radiation and with the impact of several hundred atom smashers. On the afternoon of January So 7th, what we know for sure is that these can't be mechanical craft being occupied by highly evolved biological creatures because as we learn just to get from you know the, the nearest star the, the nearest, nearest. You're right seventy thousand years to get to the nearest star how long would these entities have to be alive so you'd have to live for like millions of years sitting in your ship just to get here on a one-way trip to get back yeah. home to your family you know you come harass a couple cows and fly around, you know, a farm. That t tends to be what they do. They harass animals and perform surgical examinations. Well, and we're going to get to a point where, well, for that. The, you know. And teletransportation. Say again. Teletransportation. Well, that that's a theory. But but remember, you, you're talking about movie, what appears to be mechanical craft that land. And these entities come out. And when we get to the kidnappings, the kidnappings always, only ever seem to involve gynecological examinations. What's so, that? What's uh, that? Uh, examining the so ovaries so and the testicles of males. Oh, so okay. they extract so eggs and semen from the kidnapped people. Oh my God. And then they harass cows and, and take different body parts and then they disappear. So what's the chance that somebody traveled 70,000 years in this highly advanced spacecraft to perform a gynecological exam on a girl, or uh, you know, a testicular exam on a male, jump back into the ship and do another seventy thousand years to get home to report that hey, there's there's people on other planets and this is how they reproduce. Why are they so fascinated with the reproductive system of human beings? We're going to get to that in detail next week when we get to the part about the return of the Nephilim because there's an explanation wow. in the Bible for that as well. So let's jump ahead <laughs> to our next uh, clip this is there. Exciting. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's really know. interesting. Now here comes the part about the government cover up. Oh, the government. Oh, go ahead. Wait, so I really think I've actually seen a UFO before. Wow, what'd you see? Um, so it was really late at night, and I remember seeing this object in the sky that looked like a star. And then instead of it like going like like towards us or like you know in our like realm. It went in like almost like Star Wars, where it was like, like fascinating. Like, How old were you? And you I saw that? never, ex I've never seen it ever again. And I was nineteen. Where it were you was at? Like at two a.m. I was coming home over the bridge. And when you say home, people on YouTube don't yeah, know you where you live. Right? Right? It was oh, it was in um, it was in Merritt Island, Florida. Okay, so so Florida, by the way, has been you know you know home to some of the strangest and most outstanding UFO sightings. In fact, yeah. right after World War II, uh, like 12 uh, you know, Air Force pilot bombers disappeared right off the coast of Fort Lauderdale and disappeared into the so-called Bermuda Triangle. Bermuda Triangle. Right. And in my hometown, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and again, I mentioned that one of the most notorious sightings ever occurred there. And the government tried to cover it up by sending in this special astronomer, this, this world-class famous guy, J. Allen Hynek, who later became a proponent of the UFO theory. He was sent to Ann Arbor to explain away the sighting. We're going to take a look at that. And, and you know, only in this case, there were like 50 girls from a Christian college in Ann Arbor that saw it for four hours. The chief of police of the Ann Arbor Police Department, the chief of police of the Dexter Police Department from the neighboring town, you had all these legitimate individuals, including Christian college girls and police officers. And when the government sent in J. Allen Hynek, who was the head of this, this cover-up attempt called uh, Operation Blue Book, then people became outraged. And Gerald Ford, who became the president of the United States, had, was actually a congressman for the state of Michigan at the time and had gone to school in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan in undergrad. And when he had heard about this, he called for a congressional investigation. So we can see that the cover-up begins 
you know, as soon as Roswell happens in 1947, but it really picked up in 1965 onward when there was an incredible UFO flat from the 60s through the 70s right up to present day. So that's interesting, Shell, that you saw that. I never knew how to explain it. I was like, it was not earthly. Like it, it was like almost like Star Trek or Star Wars. It went into the sky. Wow. And, and there's an explanation for it. It was fast. It was like... Wow, and so we're going to have an explanation. Some of what we're seeing that are UFOs, we're going to suggest are not physical entities, and some of what we're seeing are physical entities, maybe highly advanced knowledge entities. But let's go ahead and look at the next clip here. Oh, and it wasn't, uh, and it wasn't a shooting star. I will say that. It wasn't a shooting star. How will you know that? Because it just looked very peculiar. It was like very weird. I didn't know how to explain it. I feel like grandma a lot of shooting stars a lot. I've seen a lot of shooting stars. I went okay. like into the sky. It didn't fall down. Great team. Here's the guy. Great Dr. You. J. Allen Hyatt. Oh, there was the Air Force and UFO. This is the government's cover-up cover guy. Group, and was acknowledged to be the world's foremost authority on mm -hmm. UFOs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After amassing a computer bank of over 63,000 sightings, he states, The UFO phenomenon is truly a phenomenon of our time. It is an extremely puzzling one and calls forth a wide spectrum of opinion. No matter what one may think about UFOs, no matter what one may believe about them, whether it is all nonsense or whether they represent something very, very real, three facts stand out. Three facts which no one can deny. The first is that UFO reports exist. Secondly, that UFO reports come from all over the world. And the third is that many are made by highly responsible people often scientifically trained. We scientists have no positive proof yet of the origin or even of the reality of these strange reported crafts. But we do know the reports themselves are very real. To find the answer to this magnificent scientific puzzle, the UFO phenomenon, we need to approach it with a truly open mind so we can explore all possible avenues of explanation. Among those who claim to have... So what we see here is that he's admitting that UFOs are in fact real, uh, you know, uh, occurrences and real things. Now, what we're, the next clip we're going to see is the one that occurred in my hometown back in 1965. And he later, this guy you just heard talking, J. Allen Hynek, who was the head of the government's Project Blue book, said just before he died, he said that his attempt to explain away the sighting in Ann Arbor, Michigan was the, was the biggest regret of his entire career. He basically admitted later that the government forced him to lie about what his investigation entailed because he's going to explain away this sighting in Ann Arbor by saying it was uh, swamp gas or the planet Venus. And he said, basically, it wasn't true, but the government forced me to say it. So let's take a look and see what he says mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that Ann Arbor sighting. One fall President Carter saw a UFO. Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, on November 7th, a number of other individuals that have, early you know, impressive credentials have seen UFOs. Here's the one in Ann Arbor. One of the greatest waves of UFO sightings in modern history came in 1965, with more than 500 cases reported during the wow. summer months alone. One such case was near Ann Arbor, Michigan, where 50 people so this and is my police town. officers in three counties wow. reported having seen objects flashing across the pre-dawn skies. That evening, 87 female students Except. at Hillsdale College near Ann Arbor watched an object flying around and flashing bright lights for a period of about four hours. Wow, that's a long Life time. Life magazine said, that's a long time. call them what you will, flying saucers. These were sorority girls at the University of Michigan. This was the, this was the Christian college on the other side of town. They were the Christian college. Well, right. I mean, these girls probably weren't sorority girls coming back from a frat party. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Very convenient. In Washington, House Minority Leader Gerald Ford called for a full-blown investigation. Thus, the first congressional hearings on U.S. Earth began as a closed-door <laughs> session on April 5, 1966. Wow, 66. Their conclusion was that a major university be given the job of researching the U.S. So they assigned the University of Colorado to investigate this. University of Colorado. And Edward Cowan, professor of physics, 
would serve as chairman of the group. And again, we have that another government cover-up. A 1,465 page report was completed by 36 authors at a cost of more than half a million dollars. Yes. The report was summed up under the section titled Conclusions and Recommendations. It states, our general nothing. conclusion is that nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that is added to scientific knowledge. Careful consideration of the record leads us to conclude that further extensive study of UFOs probably cannot be justified in the expectations that science will be advanced thereby. They didn't say anything. On April 7th. <laughs> so basically, again, you have all this money spent. You have yeah. all of these eyewitnesses, credible people, police officers, chiefs of police, and they you know, college girls, and they just brush it off and say it, it's not real. So the question is, why is the government now changing course after 50 years of constant denials of what were obviously real sightings? I would submit to you as part of the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, coming deception. Remember, the Bible says that Satan, not Jesus, is the god of this world, and that all the nations of the world are under Satan's control. Is it possible that the governments are being used to manipulate our mindsets in now believing in UFOs because now is the time that the rapture is about to occur. Satan knows the rapture is coming, and I think that he's using this UFO paradigm to prepare the hearts and minds of the people to reject mm -hmm. the truth that the rapture actually occurred. Right. We've got a few more clips here. Let's jump ahead to the next one here. Uh, you see, she's in charge. She's her brother again. I can see who doesn't see Oh, this is an interesting one. 1973. A young Pennsylvania father, Stephen Pulaski. Now this is where the Nephilim argument comes into play. Right now you have the UFO, but he now you have entities coming out. It was then that he noticed something walking along by the fence. They were hairy and And warm notice what they say, how it affects him. And the smell like burning rubber was present. Burning rubber. Stephen burning. sensed that these creatures were not friendly and fired a trace of bullet over their heads. And when they kept on coming, he fired directly at one of them. The creatures then all disappeared into the woods, and the glowing object disappeared from the field instantaneously. UFO researchers, as well as a state trooper, were to, to invest. They call the cops. When they arrived, the people there told them that Stephen had been growling like an animal and flayed his arms. His own dog ran toward him, and Stephen attacked the dog. Stephen then collapsed after a time began to come to his senses. The entire group commented on the nauseating, sulfur-like odor that was present. Do you think he was One of the earliest he was to a spacecraft is and, probably... And there you go. That, that's an excellent comment. You, you see the UFO, the, the flying saucer, but then you see two entities that apparently came from out of the ship and they have this sulfur-like smell. Where have we heard that before? Any account of demonic possession, houses that are demon possessed, the Amityville horror, the smell of sulfur, the description of the creature known as Bigfoot, which oh. I would submit to you is tied into this return of the Nephilim. The Bible talks about these strange and being called the Nephilim. Bigfoot sightings always right. are accompanied by the smell of sulfur or stench, but demon possession is too. Oh, so this wow. guy sees. The UFO and sees two entities that smell sulfuric like a demon possession situation. Next thing you know, he's acting out as if he were demon possessed. Right. That's not something that would occur when you meet somebody from another country or from another planet. Yeah. It would cause you to act out in a spiritual way that's different than the way you've ever acted. So what you have tipped off, Michelle, is that, oh, okay. yes, there's something more to these UFO sightings than meets the eye. Yeah. And maybe it's not extraterrestrials from the planet Venus. Right. Maybe we're talking about demonic entities oh. or fallen angels. So we'll get to that in the next clip. Let's take a look. We, we oh, have just goodness. a couple more, so stay with me. We're going to hear from uh, Dr. Heineck again, who again tried to deny the Antarctic sighting, but then eventually came on board oh, an and admitted Egyptian. the truth of these things. So, let's take a look at the next clip. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, 
explains one alternative theory that we might be dealing with something from another dimension. There you go. One of the most intriguing aspects of UFO sightings said. is their apparent isolation in space and time. Sightings are usually made in one place at a time and last for short periods, sometimes appearing out of nowhere and vanishing into nowhere. This is much more suggestive of a parallel reality than, let's say, visits from some faraway planet, in which case we might expect them to stick around for a while. Right? You're not going to go 70 million years to, to stick around for five minutes and then go back home. Right. And is widely recognized as the lead UFO publication in the world. It's authored by over 50 experts worldwide who conduct major UFO investigations. Yet an official statement by editor Gordon Creighton is most amazing. Quote, there seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. End quote. Where did they come from then? Right. Right. Close encounters of the fourth kind are by far the so, I watched that movie. That freaked me out. Well, well, actually, you're about to. What he's talking about, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, is actually uh, is part of a classification system. There was actually a movie made called Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Third. Oh. which I saw. Oh. And it turns out that a lot of that movie was based upon that sighting in Ann Arbor because J. Allen Hynek eventually became Steven Spielberg's. Uh, consultant on the film and basically told him these are the sightings that we that I investigated that we couldn't explain away and that's why it resonated with me so much as a kid when I was watching this stuff and so let's go ahead and you saw said, that movie yeah it freaked me out oh yeah it, you know it was the first movie that really dealt with it in a serious in a serious way. Because they showed like the real Perhaps the most famous case was that of Betty and Barney. Oh, here, here's the sight that we've got on the 9th of September 19, 1961. This is key. They were returning this is it, their people? home Shabbat from a vacation people? in Canada. Oh, yeah, this is key. They They're saw coming back from vacation in Canada. It seemed to move erratically. As it moved closer, it became more intense. Betty Hill remembers. This craft left the top of the mountain came out of the highway and stopped. Probably the most famous Why UFO abduction story in the history of the planet. In the attempt to identify the craft. And as he did this, he saw a group of figures standing in the windows looking down at him. One was saying to him, don't be afraid, keep looking, keep looking, stay there. Don't be afraid, no harm's going to come to you, but stay there. And the craft started to be slammed. And Barney ran back to the car, saying we had to get out of there, they were going to capture us. And we took off speeding down the highway. They thought they had escaped. They made it home without but they did. Incident. But in the days and months that followed, they experienced nightmares, flashbacks, and extreme anxiety. They were also unable to account for more than two hours between the time they first encountered the UFO and the time they reached home. Where had the missing time gone? Hmm. What had happened? They sat out a psychiatrist, and through hypnosis, Betty and Barney Hill narrated a tale much stranger than the one that had been lodged in their conscious mind. Listen to this. Barney put on the brakes, the camera of his eyes, they separated, came up on each side, took us out, took us in a path through the woods, took us on board, gave us physical examinations, we're being kidnapped. Betty Hill remembers being able to offer a detailed description of her alien abductions. They're all shot. The leader, I would say, was my height, but just a little taller than I am. I'm five foot. They were bald, no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, and no earlobes. No ear, no, we could say. Very large eyes, very small, flat nose, thin slit for mouth. Benny Hill said that they were most interested in human sexuality and that they communicated through a form of telepathy that sounded like a voice loud and clear inside their heads. Now that's fascinating. They come 70 million years. So can you imagine? I, I remember flying to Israel was studying the Middle East for a semester at Tel Aviv University. And I remember the flight was like 12 hours long. I was like, my gosh, I, I'll never sit in a, in a seat again for 12 hours straight. Can you imagine sitting in a little cockpit inside of a flying saucer for 70 million years just to land, kidnap a girl, examine her ovaries, 
and then jump back in your ship and fly another 70 million years back to your planet to report, like, hey, they got, you know, so creatures. So what is the explanation about what? the fascination of the human reproductive Right, system? so that that's a clue to who and what these entities are. And the shell kind of began, like, hey, well, like, I'm putting two and two together. Maybe they're not from another galaxy. Maybe, on hold on. And, and so, we're... Well, look at that. You guys, <laughs> you guys are much more clever than most people. You're ahead of the curve. We've got like two more clips to look at, and now we're going to get to the conclusion that these uh, documentarians came to. Um, and the great Dave Hunt, who was, was you know, mentoring me, he appears in the video, and um, he's going to give an explanation. And the guy who wrote this book called The Omega Conspiracy, uh, a Welsh pastor named I.D.E. Thomas, oh. comes to the conclusion as to what? we are dealing with here and why is that tied to what we're doing as evangelical christians in what i would submit to you the last of the last days and how the government admitting in the last few weeks that ufos are real and they may be extraterrestrial that should light a fire under us because that means satan knows <coughs> that our time is almost up yeah. which means we should know that our time is almost up and it should motivate us to do what we're going to talk about at the conclusion of the video. But let's jump to the last when couple they were, When well, they I were in a... the car, um, when they were in the car, um, yeah. was it the husband that told the wife, do not be afraid? or was No, it, it was them. They were te telepathically telling, no, don't be afraid. Which don't is really run. weird. Because don't run. Angels have said it to the shepherds, do not be afraid. Wow. So so, so what do we do? Are we, are we right. dealing, right? Are we dealing with somebody from the Andromeda galaxy and if so why would they have if they want to come strange, here to be friends right? with us yeah. why would they basically harass kidnap a girl and basically rape her or steal her her ovary eggs and then go back to their planet without visiting the united nations or right. the white house doesn't seem like these are entities who are highly evolved enlightened creatures right, right. from another planet in another galaxy because that's not how people do when they want to meet you know people right. take them to your leader and yeah. then let's talk <laughs> so <laughs> right so we've got one right. last clip that we're going to look at we're recording him so let me let me i have a, a i have a relative who's a nephew of my father's actually oh my God. who is very well known as far as investigation of UFOs. Really? In, 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 Peru. in Peru. Oh my gosh. And uh, I've just got this art. My father thought he was a, he didn't want to get close to him. He said, this guy's a nuts. He was okay. Saying, but hey, this guy, he says he was transported. He was actually like was with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's in, in the writing there. here, it, he focused on UFO phenomena, particularly alien contact from a spiritual viewpoint known as the visible head of the Rama mission in Spain and a number of Latin American countries, stands out among the ufologists for having summoned the international press of sightings scheduled in advance on more than 10 occasions. Well, let me go ahead and get to the clip, because that looks like a pretty long article, but we can, yeah, but you're, yeah, so you've got a, you got a family member? I never had any contact with him, but I know of, of And him. when did you get that? Well, I knew it because my father told me about this crazy cousin that he had. So, so, so the, these UFO sightings are more prevalent than we had been led to believe. And again, now that the government's coming forward and joining on board after denying it, I think that that means we are at the end of the end times and our time is almost up on the earth That's because scary. now the time of delusion yeah. is coming. That's scary. I'm going to say yeah. something. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm an artist. You're, you're an artist. You're, 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 you're really. 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 The mic will pick up both I of you have guys. a fascination with uh, ruins. And I have been visiting. So you're an architect here. Well, we, we got in our little <laughs> audience here. You know, let's. What's your name? Say hello to everybody. Hi. So you were saying what? I'm an architect and I've been. Uh, I've always been uh, fascinated with, uh, with ruins, and I've been visiting places like um, Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu, tied into the Nephilim, and yes, exactly. And that's ancient that's alien theory. Ancient that's one of the theories. And then you exactly see all theory. these figures that you could, and nobody has been able to explain that. So that's another that's that's another powerful argument that they're going to use. They, the argument is already being s suggested by people. Richard Dawkins from uh, Oxford University, mm -hmm. professor emeritus, has said, "Oh, the Bible is false because you know uh, you know God of the Bible is evil." But what might be true is that our 
ancient alien fathers came here from another galaxy and planted DNA in the water, and that's how we got here. But those people themselves, the ancient aliens, would themselves have to be highly evolved evolutionary creatures. So again, if you take that theory, that aliens are highly advanced people that have been around for billions of years, that proves the theory of evolution is true, and it proves that the Bible is false. So let's get to the last clip, and then we're going to jump into the scripture for the time we have left. And we're going to come to the conclusion, what is the answer to the questions that we've been asking? Like, well, who or what are these things? And we're going to get to it here. In his book, Secrets of the UFOs, UFOlogist Don Elkins made the following observation. Hi, Carla. I have found that some people can achieve the contact phenomenon simply by being hypnotized. And the same general message permeates over 90% of the millions of words received by thousands of people around the world. No one knows what hypnosis is. No one knows what goes on in the mind. It's an altered state of consciousness like yogis and uh, witch doctors have been practicing. Uh, it loosens the normal connection between your state and your brain. And of course, if the hypnotist can control you, make all kinds of suggestions, yeah. make you think uh, things are happening that are not happening, make you think you have problems that you don't, experiences that you have, even implant memories, uh, other beings, if there are other minds out there, they could also do the same thing. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate. That's important. What he means by that is your spirit operates your brain in a normal state of consciousness. In an altered state, reached under yoga, a TM, hypnosis, uh, you have loosened the normal connection between your spirit and your brain, and that allows another spirit, other entities, other minds to interpose themselves and begin to tick off the neurons in your brain, create an, uh, a universe of illusion. I believe that it's demonic. So I Dave Hunt, great Bible apologist researcher, he says it's demonic. I think it's demonic. Some people claim that by allowing themselves to be put into an hypnotic trance, they are acting as a channel device in which the extraterrestrial demon speaks through them. Hmm. The following is an actual sound of those messages. This is what the extraterrestrials we tell us. come from the Interplanetary Confederation of Solar Systems, and our purpose is to aid our brother man on the planet Earth as the New Age dawns. The teacher that was known to you as Jesus was able to use many more of the abilities than the people of this planet. Unfortunately, man upon planet Earth has misinterpreted the meaning of this man's life. He was no different from any of you. He was simply able to remember certain principles. These principles may be realized by anyone at any time. It is only necessary that you avail yourself to our contact through meditation in order to begin to re-realize that which is rightfully yours, the truth of the creation and the truth of your position in it. Know ye not that ye are gods? These are aliens supposedly telling us that our belief in Jesus is misunderstanding. That's so weird. Why would they have to go right to that? We out of find anything. that the state of hypnosis brought about by the evolution of thought of the people of this planet is so great that it is necessary for him to maintain a constant awareness of his spiritual nature with meditation. Man is now in the transitional period before the dawn of a new age. That's correct. With peace, love, brotherhood, and understanding on man's part, he will see a great new era begin to dawn. So that's basically the ET message. All of these extraterrestrials supposedly coming 70 million years traveling come here to examine girls, uh, genetic and reproductive organs and to disclaim or deny that Jesus of the Bible is God. So they come weird. all the way here to deny just Christianity. That's just so biblical weird. Christianity and Jesus. They don't talk about Allah. Yeah. Nobody talks about Buddha. Nobody talks about Zoroaster. It's checking out girls' ovaries and to say, hey, your belief in Jesus is wrong. He's just like you. We're all enlightened beings. We're all gods. That's supposedly, and that has been the consistent message of these aliens when they channel their thoughts through telepathic means. We're going to finish up with the clip That's real so quick, weird. and we're going to reach. We're going to find out what, what the conclusion is. 
So let's see. All right. In his book, Flying Saucer Pilgrimage, Brian Reed summarizes his findings in this statement. From our analysis, the teachings of the space beings appear to support many of the principles taught in Oriental philosophy by seers of the Far East. <laughs> UFO researcher John Weldon then offers this question. He makes a good point. How credible is it to think that literally thousands of genuine extraterrestrials would fly millions of light years simply to teach New Age philosophy, deny Christianity, and support the occult? And why would the entities actually possess and inhabit people just like demons do if they were really advanced extraterrestrials? Yeah, that is really weird. Right? That is weird. Dr. Pierre Guerra, an eminent scientist associated with the French National Council for Scientific Research, concludes that UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it, hmm. and that modern UFO now and the demons of past days are probably identical. This guy is not a Christian that's saying this. This is a scientist. In Greek oh, wow. comes from the root meaning knowledge or intelligence, implying that demons have access to knowledge and information denied Which is true. ordinary more. Right? Yeah, they do After have what happened to me, the oh, I decided Jesus. that that might be a good idea he, to accept the idea. An academician that was kidnapped. So this was his experience. He's a psychiatrist. You see the workings of evil in the world. There seems to be a sort of a machinery behind it that is far beyond just the accident of human life. You can literally hypnotize a person, tell them that there's a cat in their lap, they will see it, they will hear it, purr, they will pet it and feel it. It's not physically there. You tell the cat to scratch them, you know, and bring them out of it, there are scratch marks on their teeth. And non-physical objects under the right conditions can leave physical evidence. Mm. Uh, I think it's demonic. It's a, uh, it's a spiritual power of some kind for which there is no physical explanation. It, you can't explain it with the laws of chemistry and physics as we know it. John Keel is a world-renowned expert on UFOs. So basically, he reaches the same conclusion that you guys reached. The described agnostic, he made this statement. Thousands of books have been written on the subject of demonology, which is the ancient and scholarly study of monsters and demons. The manifestations and occurrences described in this literature are identical to the UFO phenomenon. Victims of demonic possession suffer from the same medical and emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. I would say I was assaulted by something from the unknown rather than possessed by it. I, don't, I hope that I was never possessed by it, although there are those who might disagree. And uh, I don't think it was something out of craziness. If it came out of my mind, it came out of a part of my mind that uh, is universal to us all. Like Stryker, there are thousands of others who have also sensed something evil and demonic. Yeah, we're not talking about something aliens issue, from another planet. Probing people, inspecting them, planting thoughts in their minds, and manipulating their bodies. I do know oh, wow, that is wow. occurring in my body that I'm still being visited. In Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the first film that came out about the UFO, the house that the mother and, and little boy were living in, you know, the toys began running around, and screws unscrewing. In the presence of UFOs, what the film was saying was the same people that run UFOs run haunted houses. And I would say that's absolutely true. In 1969, the United States printing UFOs are being run by aliens. They're being run by demonic entities pretending to be extraterrestrials. This is the government research. This is interesting. She wrote this report for Congress. During her research, she read over 1,000 articles, books, and other literature. She summarizes her findings in the preface of the bibliography. A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession 
and psychic phenomena that have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. This document was compiled for the United States Air Force and is now in the Library of Congress. Wow. Dr. Jacques Vallée has Dr. addressed Lay the United was also Nations in the movie Close Encounters and was the model for Lacombe and Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books on UFOs and has been Again, widely recognized a as the premier who comes to the same conclusion the about UFO what UFO and aliens really are. That's the deception. Yeah, secular humanist scientists. This parallel can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. And in his book, Confrontations, he writes, the medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. He also made this statement. I believe that when we speak of UFO sightings as instances of space visitations, we are looking at the phenomenon on the wrong level. We are not dealing with successive waves of visitations from space. We are dealing with a control system. Controlling our thoughts. Why? And he states, because the rapture is coming, Satan needs an explanation. Are being rearranged. They are engaging in a worldwide enterprise of subliminal seduction. Jack mm -hmm. Valais, at least at that time when he wrote that book, was an agnostic. Interesting that he comes to basically the same conclusion as I do as a Christian from my research. And he said uh, about UFOs, they're real, but they're not physical. Mm. They're messengers of deception. And this was based on his research of about 20 years. They seem to be psychologically preparing, setting us up for some ultimate delusion that is too horrible even to imagine as yet. What is I would agree with that. We're going to find out in the last two minutes. I.D.E. Thomas. Dr. I.D.E. Thomas writer is one of a long line of Welsh priests. This priest. is really key. He is currently the senior pastor at the First Baptist Church of Maywood, California, and has authored several books which have enjoyed wide circulation. In his book, The Omega Conspiracy, Dr. Thomas explains the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and offers an he ties it all up and he gives us the conclusion the that you guys are looking for the answer to. As incredible as his explanation may sound, let us regard the ancient saying of Heraclitus, who 500 years before Christ said, because it is sometimes so unbelievable. This is the, the most controversial teaching in all of the Bible. The, the concept of the, the answer network. to all this and the clue to this cosmic riddle may be found in the ancient book of Genesis. And back there in chapter 6, we are told of a very amazing and bizarre event. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful and they lusted after them. And then we read they married them and sired children from them. For the past 1500 years, most scholars, including evangelical scholars, have interpreted the sons of God as the good sons of Seth and the daughters of men as the wicked daughters of Cain. They've adopted that interpretation because the other one is so bizarre and outlandish. The ancient interpretation, and in my opinion the correct one, is that the sons of God were demonic beings or fallen angels, and that they came down to earth, they lusted after the daughters of men, they married them, and produce this amazing progeny, this hybrid progeny of the Nephilim. And the very word Nephilim does not mean giants. It comes from the root Nephil, fallen ones. The early Christian fathers in the first four centuries, men like Irenaeus, Tertullian, Ambrose, for 400 years they knew no other interpretation except that the sons of God were angelic beings. Josephus, the cosmopolitan Jewish historian, says the same thing. We read in the book of Job that when God laid the foundation of the earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God are Obviously, always the sons angels, of God not, not humans. Be human beings. Adam had not been created. If this were the case of just mixed marriages between good men and wicked women, 
it is surprising that God should have issued the fire of judgment that he did. God took this stern action of wiping out the human race. Flood of Noah. And the only family that was left intact in order to re-establish, republic the new world Noah. was the family of Noah. Noah, we are told, was perfect in his generations. The word perfect does not mean, in this case, morally perfect. But we know from the story of Noah, and especially what happened after the flood, that Noah was not perfect. Right. <laughs> uh, what it means is like a lamb uh, for the Paschal sacrifice, that lamb had to be without blemish. Oh, so their bloodline. Uh, physically pure, yeah. without blemish. So it seems was the case of Noah, the only family that remained uncontaminated. Wow. from these strange beings that appear from space. Uh, the only line that was pure and clean from God's standpoint were to start a new world is the by the new civilization. Jesus said, Here it is. as in the days of Noah, so in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Uh -oh. Of all the Patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament. This is predicting the key to prophecy the return of all of these higher creatures, part human, part and Something evil. happened in the days of Noah. These are our UFO the aliens. Characteristic of Noah's time that didn't happen before or after. Wars and famines and pestilences and natural disasters have always happened. But something happened in the days of Noah. And the most sinister and bizarre of all the things that happened was this intermarriage between the angelic race and the human race. And of course, the mastermind behind it all was another angel, a fallen angel, Lucifer. Now, we believe that as they came in those days, we may very well be on the edge of another invasion from outer space, that Satan will once again make another attempt may be the final assault on the human race in order to wean men and women away from the worship of God. He has tried before, he will inevitably try again. And by seducing the human race, by sending these so-called entities from space, demonic beings, he will try to get people all over the world to worship him and to deprive God of the worship that is due to him. Wow. Fortunately, we know what the end result is going to be. But this final or omega assault that will come at the end of time may trigger the coming back of Jesus Christ to rescue his own. Satan has failed before, and the Bible predicts he will fail again. We are told quite emphatically in God's word that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Satan will make the attempt, but our God greater is he that is in him than he that is in the world. Interesting verse here. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Right. These enlightened brothers from outer space is part of this. Deception of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So now, with the time we have left, we're going to jump into the verses real quick from the Bible. And what we'll do is go ahead and have Michelle help me out with that. And let's take a look and see what are the verses that apply. We, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about how we can't, we don't believe that these aliens came in spaceships from other planets because it would take 70 million years to fly around. So UFOs in the Bible, we know that the universe is too big for these to be flying saucers from other planets. What my conclusion is, is the same that Dave Hunt, Nighy, Thomas reaches, and that is that we are looking at a control system and that the government is part and parcel of all of that, and that control system is part of the coming deception. UFOs will explain away the possibility that the rapture proves the Bible is true. So Matthew chapter 24, verses 24, verses uh, 3 through 5. Michelle, if you could read those for us real quick. Verses 3, 4, and 5. Jesus is saying this 
Now remember, this is some several thousand years after the original incursion of the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6. We're going to talk about this next week, the return of the Nephilim. The Nephilim originally came when fallen angels saw beautiful women, took on human forms, and had sexual relations, creating a race of supermen called the Nephilim. That's where you get Greek mythology, Hercules, Thor, Atlas. All of these legendary superheroes from Greek mythology were based in fact because fallen angels came down, married women, and pregnant them, created a hybrid race of supermen that upset God so much and so threatened the human race, he had to send a worldwide flood to destroy all of them. So Jesus is saying, and Michelle's going to tell us, that it's going to be just like that when the rapture occurs. When Jesus comes back in Armageddon, these Nephilim supermen that were half demon, half fallen angel, half humans, will have returned to the earth. That, I believe, is what we're looking at with these occupants of UFOs. Hybridized DNA of human manipulated by Satan and the fallen angels to create these bizarre looking creatures, which is why the heads don't look right, the eyes are too big, and they are interested in what? Examining girls. Man, we, we can't get it right like God did. We can't create a woman or a man the way God. We've got to do experiments. We've got to steal some egg cells from women and try to work on it so that when the last day's kingdom of the Antichrist during that last 70 years occurs, they'll look just like humans. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get a guy with a big bulbous head and black wrapper on eyes, you're not going to be able to trick anybody into believing he's one of us or he's a good guy. He looks like a monster. <laughs> what they're doing is, from, is these UFO occupants are doing genetic experiments to try to perfect the replication of a humanoid being like God did originally in the Garden of Eden. So Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is warning that that time, Genesis chapter 6, when the Nephilim were on the earth and they were so predominant, God had to destroy the world. Jesus seems to be saying that's the way it's going to be when I come back the second time. Read verses 3, 4, and 5. Um, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and at the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive, and shall deceive many. Wow, so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I'm warning you ahead of time that in the last days, there are going to be false Christ. Many are going to come in whose name? My name, Jesus, saying that I, who? Jesus is the Christ and will deceive many. So there are going to be false preachers and a false Messiah on the earth. Now let's jump ahead to verse 15. Somebody read verse 15, Matthew 24. My friend right here, you want to go ahead and uh, do verse 15 for me? Verse 15. So the Nephilim are not giants then? Well, they were giants. Some of them were. Remember, Satan is, is experimenting with human DNA, so he keeps getting false hits. Oh, the, okay. the, the word in the King James Version is giants, but in the Hebrew it's Nephilim, meaning fallen one. It, it happens to be that many of those first lines were gigantic people. They were 15 feet tall, some of them. Yeah. But with each passing generation, they got smaller and smaller. By the time Goliath fought David, <coughs> excuse me, fought David, he was only like nine feet tall. What Satan wants to do, I would suggest to you, is create a perfect replica of a man that doesn't look like a freak or a monster, right. so they'll be able to deceive people. Oh. So, verse 15. Verse 15. The prophet Daniel spoke about the hated thing that destroys. Daniel 2, 27, 11, 31, 12, 11. Someday you will see it standing in the holy place. The reader should understand this. Uh, that's 15. That's 15. Michelle, now in, in the King James, what does it say? Um, when we therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. 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 Spoken, uh, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who so readeth? Let him understand. So what then, that? Go uh, ahead. No, no. Was it 16.2? No, that's oh. fine. So what Jesus is saying there, he's saying the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is when the Antichrist goes into the temple of God and declares himself to be God. 
And so Jesus is saying that's going to be the key that there's only going to be the, the, the last 42 months on earth. Then I'm going to come back to go to war with the Antichrist. Verse 22, basically he's saying that that period of time will be called the Great Tribulation Period. And that is that second half of the 70th week of Daniel. And it's depicted right here. It's here that the Antichrist will go into the temple. The rapture occurs. This false new world order where aliens will come down to earth. The fallen angels will come back to earth. But they're not going to call themselves falling angels. They're like we work with Satan because then you're going to believe when the people left behind are going to believe the Bible is true. What's going to have to happen is that those individuals will have to describe themselves as the highly evolved space brothers. So... That's going to be part of this great deception. So let's jump ahead. Uh, verse 24. Uh, Michelle, go ahead and read that for me. Um, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall stew great signs and wonders um, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So great signs and wonders is what Jesus is saying Antichrist and Satan will use to deceive the people into believing a lie. And verse 29, this is a depiction Jesus is describing during this last period of time, this last seven years, known as the tribulation period. And during this period of time, what happened? Verse 29, go ahead and read that. Uh, uh, re uh, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken okay so now we're talking about Jesus is making reference the powers of heaven shall be shaken and the stars shall not give light and then he jumps ahead in verse 37, 38, and 39 I believe he's saying here that just like it was when Noah was on the earth and I had to destroy the whole world, these fallen angels creating half-human, half-demonic hybrids will be interacting with human beings. Verses 37 through 39, the return of the Nephilim. Go ahead and give me that, Michelle. Um, but as the days of uh, Noe... Noah? No, oh, okay. It, it says just mm -hmm. Noah. That's the I King know. James spelling. Oh, okay. Um, but as the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So I guarantee you, God didn't destroy the world with a worldwide flood, killing everybody on earth except Noah and his, his, his wives and kids, because people were getting married. That's not why. It was because fallen angels were getting married and giving in marriage to human women, creating a hybrid race of supermen, which was an abomination to God. That's why the flood destroyed the world. Jesus is saying in verses 37 through 39 that that's the way it's going to be on earth during the last days before I come back. And what we're seeing with these UFOs and these extraterrestrials, I believe, is a fulfillment of Jesus' prediction in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39, of the return of the Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Now, if you could, somebody jump ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and go ahead and read that for us real quick. And Michelle, let me jump to 2 Thessalonians and get that one real quick. So while he's doing this, go ahead. And while he's getting to that, basically, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, that's the verse we just looked at. It says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So Paul tells in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Satan can appear as an angel of light. What do these UFOs appear like? If they're not a metallic craft shaped like a saucer, when they're appearing in the sky, we just saw the videos of it. They look like gigantic stars. But stars don't jump around in the sky the, you know, like like uh, a water bug going across the surface of a river. That video we saw, when we saw those star-like objects jumping around the sky, I don't believe that those were saucer-shaped metallic uh, craft, but those were the fallen angels themselves. Now, it's possible that just like the fallen angels gave advanced technology to human beings to build the pyramids and to build computers and do things like that, they could also give us advanced technology to build these flying craft that defy gravity. 
But that doesn't mean they came from another part of the universe. Second Thessalonians chapter two says this, and let me go ahead and just read that for you. The Corinthians, though. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, we don't want Satan to outsmart us. We know how he does his evil work. Uh, uh, serving out of the new covenant. No, no, just just uh, that's uh, Second Corinthians. That's okay. I, we hit it pretty good. So let's jump ahead to Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses eight through twelve, and this is key. And it picks it up here. It says, "Then shall that wicked, the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Antichrist and Satan will use deception to deceive people. And here's where I think that the UFOs tie in." And it says, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11, and for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they, the people who rejected the gospel and were left behind, might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the question is, what is this the lie that Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it ties into the return of the Nephilim and UFOs. When the rapture occurs, Satan's going to have to say the UFOs, and this is what a bunch of New Age channelers, like that woman we saw there at the end wearing purple, that the UFO ascended space brothers are going to come and remove all the bad people from the earth with their Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty, teleportation beam. So when people disappear, we've already got built into our science right. fiction zeitgeist because we've been watching movies for the last 50 years about UFOs being able to beam people up off of the Earth. The New Agers are already saying that us evangelical Christians who are Bible fundamentalists, we're unloving and we're unkind. And we don't accept anyone else's religion. We don't accept evolution. We won't accept the Space Brothers coming to help us to preserve the earth so they had to remove us so instead of believing that the rapture of john chapter 14 verses 1 2 and 3 or first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 we're going to believe space brothers came and took the bad people the born again christians all of you guys and removed them from the earth so that the earth could be free to be happy so oh, basically wow. Wow. right so, yeah. so they're going to be removed after yeah. all this Wow. After all this learning, we're going to get a remove us. <laughs> right? And so. Yeah, but still, like, that actually makes a lot of sense because they think of us as bad. And we're so, the bad guys, yeah, guys. I'm telling you. It. Satan wrote this script. Yeah. And he's got television, Hollywood movies, the entertainment industry, yeah. and yeah. social media. The bad guys are us. Yeah. Maybe back in the 1950s, the Christians were the good guys. The bad guys now are you and me because we're fundamentalists. And we're unloving because we won't accept any other God other than God the Father and the right. Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. We won't accept that anybody can go to heaven except people that are born again by faith in Jesus. Right. We believe that everybody that dies without believing in Jesus goes to hell. Right. That's not loving. So they have to get rid of us. Right. And the only way to get rid of us and explain away our disappearance will be extraterrestrials, UFOs, and the beam me up Scotty technology that will explain away the disappearance of millions of people. Yeah. We've already talked about Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. We're going to look at that in detail next week. That's the return of the Nephilim that originally showed up in Genesis chapter 6 when fallen angels interacted with human women, impregnated them, and created a hybrid race of beings. And it's, there's an interesting passage in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Somebody, uh, if, if somebody can find Daniel chapter 2... Um, there is a real interesting passage there, written about 500 years before Jesus came to be, where Daniel says, and I'll go ahead, I already got it marked out, so I'm going to jump ahead to that, while uh, somebody can flip over to Luke chapter 21, verse 26. I got it. You got it? You got Luke? <laughs> no, you got Daniel? I got Daniel. All right. So Michelle, read Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. I've, I've read over this, and, and it wasn't until Chuck Missler pointed out what I think the real meaning there is. What does it say in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, written 500 years before Jesus? You saw the iron mixed with clay. The people will mix with one other. The people will mix with one another. 
but will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with fiery clay. Okay, so now I don't know what version of the Bible that is, but Christian the, standard. the newer translations, I would suggest you guys, as we get closer to the time of the end, get rid of your new, new age translations, your modern translations, and get a King James Bible. Because, you know, the Alexandrians and the Luciferians, the modern translations are easier to read because they're more like regular common standard English, but they delete a lot of information. This is what it says in the King James Version when you get to Daniel chapter 23, uh, verse 43. It's talking about the kingdom of the Antichrist, and he says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. So if the they that are mingling themselves are mingling themselves with the seed of men, what does it mean? The, what does the they that it's doing the mingling have to mean? If they're mingling with human beings, the personal pronoun they means that the people doing the mingling have to be something other than human beings. They, I will submit to you, and this is the dream of Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a metallic man. And at the end of that dream, Daniel interpreted a kingdom that will consist of human beings combined together with non-human beings. If the they doing the mingling, mingling themselves with the seed, seed in the Hebrew is the word zera. That's the Hebrew word for DNA. What Daniel is saying in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, is in the last day's kingdom of the Antichrist, non-human beings are going to mix their genetic material together with human DNA to create, again, what? The hybrid race of super beings that we know in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, was referred to as the Nephilim, or the fallen ones. Because their fathers were angels that had fallen down out of the kingdom of heaven and came to live on the earth with human women. That's why you have the myth of Hercules. Zeus came down from Mount Olympus, impregnated a human woman, and created a superman called Hercules. The same thing happened with Thor. Thor's so father, like Odin, had sex with a human woman and created the god of thunder. The yeah. same thing happened with Prometheus, or Hercules, or Achilles, or Hector. All of these creatures or these heroes from Greek mythology are individuals who were half human and half fallen angel. In Luke chapter 21, right, verse... I got that, Luke. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead and read verse 26 of Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, 20, uh, 26. 21 and 26. Okay, 26. Uh, terror will make people faint. They will be worried about what is happening in the world. The sun, moon, and stars will be shaken from their places. Okay, and in the King James it says, Men's, men's hearts failing. There you go. Give it to me in the King James. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shaken, uh, shall be shaken. A great Bible prophecy teacher from back in the 1970s and 80s, he said that this verse was making reference to UFOs. He was saying this back in the 70s, that those things coming upon the earth causing men to have heart attacks and die because they're afraid. What things? Not shooting stars. Is it possible that Luke chapter 21 verse 26 is referring to UFOs that are coming down upon the earth and landing and these extraterrestrials get out and they're these hybrid supermen. That's consistent with the very first prophecy in the Bible. We'll end it right there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If somebody can jump to that um, and read that, I'd like you reading it. King James. <laughs> Give me, King James is just awesome. It's the most accurate of all of the English language translations and it really gives you the sense of what's happening in these Genesis last days. What? Chapter 3, verse 15. The first prophecy in the Bible ever occurs just before God throws Adam and Eve out of the garden and just after the fall of man by taking the fruit of the, tr uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When that happens, God uh, shows up and pronounces judgment. He pronounces judgment on... we got fireworks supporting our Bible prophecy. we got to do those fireworks to, to show us. But um, he pronounces judgment. The woman has pain in childbirth. Adam is the responsibility for everyone on earth dying, and then he pronounces judgment on Satan. And this is what he says to serpent, the serpent who is Satan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put 
in meeting between thee and the woman, and between the seed and her seed, and it shall bruise the, the head and sh shall bruise his heel. So what that is saying in, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is saying this, I will put enmity or warfare between thee and the woman. Between thy seed, Satan, and her seed. Now, women don't have seeds. So the Hebrew word zir always refers to male reproductive uh, 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 cells, spermatozoa. But God uses that word in conjunction with the woman to show that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be born of a virgin. No man is going to participate in the birth of Christ. Joseph wasn't the biological father of Jesus. God was the biological father of Jesus. But in the same sentence where it says the seed of the woman will produce Jesus Christ, it also says that the serpent, Satan, will have a seed. And that these two guys will go to war against each other. Yeah, what yeah, Genesis yeah. chapter 3 verse 15 has to be saying is that Satan will have a biogenetic humanoid to go to war against Jesus. The Antichrist will be in the form of the human body, but will be part demonic. And he will literally walk on the earth and go to war with Jesus Christ, who was the born of a woman, uh, born of a virgin, us. Uh, Messiah, right? Us. And well, when you say us, what do you mean? It's like our, it's our human DNA. Right, so Jesus became a son of Adam, a human being, to die for the sins of, of that's why Paul calls Jesus the last Adam, the second man. Why? Because Jesus became a man to die for the sins of men. There is no uh, counterpart for fallen angels. Jesus didn't become a Nephilim to die for the sins of fallen angels. They have no way of being saved, which is why they resent and hate us so much. So that's it for today. Next week when we come back, we're going to look at uh, the return of the Nephilim. But one of the reasons why the UFO being revealed in uh, the media is so important for us as evangelical Christians is that it's... Uh, an alert that we are running out of time. Satan's running out of time to get his last one world government together, but we as believers are running out of time to do what? To fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission of the church in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 is what? Anybody here want to have an against? Sure. Preaching the gospel and making disciples. And that's why I brought our chick tracks with us today. Our job in the church isn't to provide clean drinking water to starving children in Haiti or Africa. As nice as that may be, the command Jesus gave us as the church was to do what? Spread to go the into the world and preach the gospel. And what we have here are chick tracks. This, these are the tracks that we use in our ministry there. And so the homework assignment of you guys is to take one of these packs and try to pass them out. Next week when we come back, you're going to have to give a report card and report what happened <laughs> oh, no. when you tried to pass out. Each one of these packs yeah. has 25 tracks. Not a rejection. Not, not a thousand, but just 25. So each one of you is going to get your own chick track pack, and you're going to have to try to hand out as many as you can. You get a gold star if you were able to pass out all of them. And so we got you on video here proving oh, that you oh, actually oh. done. See, we got videographic proof. That you guys act. This one's about the rapture. That one's about a girl who dies of cancer but leaves her friends to the Lord and she's not afraid because she's dying. It's a really moving track. That one's about Judgment Day and what happens at Armageddon. So you guys are each on camera getting your own pack of tracks. And now you got one week to fulfill the Great Commission and pass out those 25 tracks. And if you can do it, you'll have rewards in heaven. And even if they reject you, yeah, you still so get yeah. full price coverage for trying. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> so with that, then, we're going to end it, and we'll open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions or comments before we go off there, now's the time to make it. Anybody want to say anything to our YouTube family out there? Like and subscribe, South Beach Gospel Ministry. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you, you next week when you come back, you'll give us a report as to how it went with the track packs. Well, I have a question. And go ahead. Nephilim are evil. Yeah. They are half, half demonic, demonic, demonic appearing in human form. Satan can't create his own race of people, so he has to steal human DNA and modify it. Right. Which is why these aliens pretending to be from outer space 
are kidnapping women and examining their reproductive organs. So what is the obsession now with the government and the DNA? Well, uh, the DNA is so Satan can create his army of hybrids to go to war against Jesus at Armageddon. And Matthew uh, and Revelation... The harvesting of DNA is for that. Yeah, the harvesting of DNA is to create an army of supermen so that they can go to war against Jesus at Armageddon and they can have... They don't want it's like regular super humans. Super they human. want... Comic books and Greek mythology are one and the same. I was obsessed with comic books as a kid, and then I the Holy Spirit revealed like superheroes. Right? Superheroes yeah. are the Nephilim return in tights. Wow. So we put a cape on them and put tights on them, and we fall in love with them. Superman is a Christ-like figure who replaces Christ. If we have a real Superman that shows up on the scene, we're not going to need Jesus anymore. We'll have Superman to wow. save us. And I believe so Satan... that's the brainwash that started way back then. I, absolutely. Greek mythology. Then it was picked up in the 1930s and 40s and 50s with Superman and then Batman and then in the 60s and 70s, the Avengers and Spider-Man and Iron Man and the whole... Captain if, America. Right, Captain America. If we can get a, a team of superheroes that have superpowers, we're not going to need the term Jesus. Wow. And if Satan can correctly manipulate this, he can threaten us. You know, President Reagan during, during his time in the White House kept talking about a UFO invasion would unite all the nations of the earth. Satan wants to unite all the nations of the world under his authority. And if he can use a UFO invasion to scare people into abandoning their nationalism and all uniting together so he can protect us from the space invaders, but guess who the space invader is going to be? It's going to be when Jesus Christ comes back at Armageddon. Seven, year, seven years later. Seven years later, he's going to have a team of superheroes, and he's going to trick the people of the earth into taking the mark of the beast and signing up for his team. And when Jesus comes back with the church and his angels, Satan is going to trick the earth into thinking these are the aliens from the Venusian galaxy and the Andromeda star system. Because the Bible says... That Antichrist and the people of the earth, the armies of the earth, are going to go out to Armageddon to go to war against God. And Chuck Missler, a great Bible teacher, said, I, I couldn't figure out what, what would possess a human being to do something as stupid as take up arms to go to war with the God of the universe. If Satan tricks him into thinking that Jesus, when he comes back, isn't God in human flesh, but an alien from another galaxy coming to take over the Earth, just like we see in every science fiction movie that's ever come out, aliens are coming to take over the Earth. Now we got the Avengers and other yeah. superheroes with Nephilim powers to yeah. save us from the invaders from outer space. The invaders from outer space would be Jesus, his church, and the holy angels coming back to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. But Satan's going to trick the people of the planet earth into believing we're invaders from another planet. So with that then, we've gone so long. We're going to end it right there. We're going to pick it up next week. So see you guys next week.